important. Dear Lord, we just commend everything into your hands, Lord. We commend this election coming up in a couple of more days. We know that you are in full control of everything, Lord. And uh, we ask that your, your church, those who call themselves Christians, would be Christians and vote the right way. And that they, Lord, that yeah, Lord, just do a miracle. Keep fraud away from this election. Uh, let those who are righteous lead our country, our state, our county, our city, Lord. And Father, we also lift up uh, just uh, the things that are going on here at this church, Lord. Just go before it. And Father, we ask that you would work it all out. And we love you. We praise you. And thank you that we are called to be salt and light uh, in this world. And so, Father, we ask that you would just empower us by your spirit that they may see you, most importantly. Teach us right now through the book of Ezra that we may know you more. We love you and praise you. Come upon us with your spirit, and we just thank you for your word tonight. In your holy name, amen. All right, new book smell. The book of Ezra, we love it. Tonight's study is really two parts in one night, and we're going to tackle a timeline of Jewish history after the destruction of the temple. And then we're going to look at an overview, a quick overview of the book of Ezra. Now let's tackle this timeline. What's it all about? What is Ezra all about? Well, let's, we got to look at, we got to get the timeline down. Now, we just studied and finished the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, and all of Judea by the hands of the Babylonians. That Babylonian invasion occurred by the hand of a king named Nebuchadnezzar. I always love that name, Nebuchadnezzar. It just, it just sounds fun to say. And when King Nebuchadnezzar came in, he had three waves of his, of his attack. The first wave was known by, we, we kind of clumped them together. The first wave was captivity, where he took captive the prominent people, the kingly lines, the, the young men, the important people of note in the city of Jerusalem and Judea. And he takes them captive. He also takes away some of the, uh, the, the gold and the uh, sacred instruments of the temple. And he carries them away. So captivity happens. And then he puts in charge a king of his choosing. Now, with that said, he then goes away, but they rebel. And, and what happens with uh, the king there? The king, uh, of course, is... Um, uh, Zedekiah, and Zedekiah is in there, and, and he rebels, thinking he could fight Nebuchadnezzar and the great Babylonian Empire. And when he comes in, the second wave is siege, and he puts the whole city under siege. And then, after the siege, he breaks in, and he destroys that third wave, destroys the temple, destroys many of the cities of Judah, and it's a harsh time. Now, with that first captivity, a guy by the name of Daniel is taken. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are taken. During the second and third wave of captivity, he takes away uh, Ezekiel. And why? Why does all this occur? Well, it's just very clearly, it's two reasons. God thoroughly told them this is going to happen all the way back in the in the law days with Moses if you have idolatry we're going to the one of the final straw straws is going to be guess what you're going to be taken away into captivity by a foreign power now this happened on a small scale but this is a big scale it's a huge scale and it's a result of their idolatry and also it's a result of their disobedience because they refused to give the land their Sabbath year rest. The land was due every seven years to have a Sabbath rest. And they didn't give it to the land. So, guess what? For 70 years, the land will remain untouched, unfarmed. And it will get the rest that God promised it. That's how much God keeps his promises. Even to the dirt, which we call Israel. And so it was public, it was on record that this is going to happen, and it happened. And so Babylon invaded. Now, during this time, there was a great prophet by the name of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is there, and he is prophesying against those last four kings of Judah. And he's laying out the prophecies against them and speaking out against them. And then it finally goes down. The destruction of Jerusalem. And Jeremiah is just distraught as he's seen the whole country, the whole city of Jerusalem, 
taken captive after that third wave. They're being led away in chains. And he crawls up onto this stone cliff face, a little hole in the cliff face. It's, it's not a little hole, it's a big hole. It's enough for him to sit inside. It looks like a grotto. They call it a grotto today. And they call it Jeremiah's Grotto. And there he sat watching the children of Israel be taken away northward. It's on the north side of town. And just to the left of it, there's this, the road is right there. In about a hundred or a couple hundred years later, same place, same location, a man, a Nazarene, will be taken to that same location and be crucified. The same place that he wrote the book of Lamentations, just to the, to the west of it, sorry, to the east of it, is Calvary, Golgotha. It's amazing. So he's there in total lamentation, Jeremiah is, crying out to God, prophesying to the people, writing lamentations down. But remember, Jeremiah told them how to act while they're away in captivity. He says, it's coming. You can't deny it. It's going to happen. And in Jeremiah 29, let's just read that real fast. If you're going to turn over there, Jeremiah 29, verse 1. Jeremiah 29, verse 1, it says, Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive. So he writes them a letter while they're away. That first wave of captivity that was taken, he writes those guys a letter to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. This happened after uh, 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 Jeconiah, the king, the queen mother, the eunuchs, and the pr princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and all the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of uh, Shaphan, and it's all these big names whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, so he was writing the the cap, the, that first wave of captivity that went, he's writing them a letter. And he says, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now he's, he's prophesying, so he's speaking God's word. He says, Build houses, God tells them through Jeremiah. You guys are going to be in Babylon? Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. So he says, be fruitful. Your Jewish kids marry Jewish girls and Jewish boys. They make sure that, it's, that you keep going. Still have kids. Verse 7, and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. So he says, while you're away, don't be a, you know, just submit to the government and pray for the peace of the city that you're going to be in, whether it's Babylon or wherever they're at. And they were, they were taken to some pretty bad cities. We'll get to that in a second. For thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which they cause you to dream. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. There were the people in the group that was taken away captive that were false prophets. He says, don't listen to those guys. Don't listen to them at all. But I want you to just occupy. I want you to build houses. Plant vineyards. I want you to be a productive member of Babylonian society in the Jewish world, and I want you to increase in population. But don't listen to those false prophets. Verse 10 For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you. I'm going to bring you back after 70 years and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. 
then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me. Then you, will, then you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from the nations and from the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. What a promise. Going into this really scary situation, he says, hey, I want you to get married, have kids, build houses, be productive, be fruitful, multiply, all that stuff. He says, and don't listen to the bad guys that got taken away captive. And then also, I want you to just remember my promises and what my thoughts towards you are. Now, we often use this verse for us. And you know what? You can. I, I, I'm serious, guys. I'm Jeremiah 29, 11. There are people out there who say, oh, I'm sorry. That's only for captives in Israel. Back in the day, you can't use that for you. Oh, just, when you hear that, just, just grab the guy in love and go, noogie, noogie, noogie. No, of course it's for you. So you're saying that God doesn't know your th the thoughts towards you? What are you saying? That uh, God's pe uh, thoughts towards us are not of peace or an evil? What you, come on, of course this is God's heart towards us as well. But yeah, it was given to them. And it's also for us because that's how God rolls. Can't deny it. And so with that said, man, what a great promise. He says, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring you back. And that's what Jeremiah tells them to do. Now, the next thing in the timeline, <laughs> Babylon brings up a guy named Gedaliah. And Gedaliah is there, and, and, or Gedaliah, whatever. Gedaliah, Gedaliah, he's there. And guess what? He's the governor. And he tells the people, kind of like what Jeremiah says, just don't sweat it. It's all done. We took, everybody's been taken out. It's all done. Now let's just rebuild, live our lives, and enjoy. And the people kill the guy. They kill the governor. They said, uh-uh, and they kill him. And when this happens, those assassins run away with, a group, with their families and everything. And that's when you start to see a, a leaving of the area because they knew if we, because we killed the governor, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come back for a fourth wave. So we better get out of here. And so a group of people left for Ammon. And, those the, and they ran away and got out of town. And they took their people and they left. Another group says this is going to get bad because of what happened to, to Gadaliah. So we're going to get out of here. And so they took off for Egypt. And guess who they kind of shanghaied? They, they took him by, they, he didn't want to go, but he went. It was Jeremiah. They grabbed Jeremiah and says, come on, dude, you're coming with us. And they carried Jeremiah off to Egypt just to save him. And so they left. And you know where they ended up dwelling? In old school Goshen area. They went back to Goshen. And we know also that they went all the way up the, which is south, they went up the Nile River a long way. And they, they kind of inhabited that area in Egypt. So there was a group of people in Amman, Jordan, who had fled. You got the Egyptian Jews that are back in town, back in the old Egypt. But there are some that stayed in Judah. It was the remnants. There was a small group that stayed in Judah, and they had a hard time there. They lived in, there was a, they has always been a Jewish remnant in the, in Jerusalem and Judea. And then there were the Israelites that were left in the northern ten tribes that had now intermarried with foreign brides and men that had been moved in by the Assyrians a couple of, like a hundred years previous. And they are now producing a new race of people that we call the Samaritans. Like, isn't that the same people in the gospel? Yeah. Isn't that like one of them good? Yeah, the good Samaritan. That, those guys. And so they're starting their life up in the uh, area of old, uh, the ten tribes of Israel. But a large chunk of Jews. And these Jews are people of Judah, Levites and priests of the tribe of Benjamin, and also a smattering of those tribes that left Israel and blended in with the Judah area. 
you will see in the book of Daniel him referred to and also the book of Ezekiel as speaking to the, the people in Babylon as the whole family of Israel. All tribes. All 12 of them. So they're all blended together now. And that's how it is. Someone, someone always talks about where's the lost ten tribes. They're not lost. They're just all smushed together now. And they're there. And someday they'll, they'll be able to figure out who's who. But they all live in Babylon, a large majority of them. And they live in this little place. It's an offshoot, a little river right off the, right off the Euphrates River called the River Chebar. And they take over the towns that were kind of run down towns. We know this because in archaeology, and the Bible says that it has the word Tel there. The word Tel means uh, it's, a, it's a city that is built upon ruins. And in Babylonian culture, when you see a word that says Tel uh, Abab or Tel uh, Rabbah, and these towns that have Tel in front of it, in the Babylonian context, it's a dump. And so they put the Jewish people in the dump towns. And so they're living in kind of like a, a, a ruin. They're living off of a, a small little shoot of the river called the River Chebar. And that's where the Jews of Babylon are living. And so they're doing what Jeremiah said to do, living. And they're there for the, the next 70 years. They're living in cities that are desolate, bad, run-down cities. They are starting their own little Jewish communities. And you know, they, the Jews kind of do that. They have their communities. They have their, uh, in Europe, they were called shtetls. In New York, you know, it's called Brooklyn. It's, you know, you have those places. In LA, it's called Fairfax. And so you have those areas that Jews kind of dwell and they set up their own cultural identity. And they do this in Babylon. They keep their own communities, they keep the law, they keep their traditions, they keep, uh, they, they, they're keeping those things together. Now there is lamenting and longing to go back to Jerusalem. You see this in Psalms 126, if you want to turn there, please do. Psalms 126 is written after, maybe even during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, but in Psalms 126, we see the, the heart of these guys while they're in exile in Babylon. It says, when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion. Now, this is when they're coming back to Jerusalem. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouths was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Bring back, this was their heart song, bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And this was a psalm of ascent. They would sing this while they were going up to Jerusalem on their pilgrim feasts. And it's just a great song. And if you want another psalm that was written during that time about the exiles, Psalms 137. Psalms 137 says this, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us away, the Babylonians, uh, asked us a song. Hey, hey, Jew, sing for us. Sing, sing for us. And those who plundered us requested a happy song, a mirth, saying, sing us one of those songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And then he says this, Oh, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Wow. That's Jerusalem to the heart of a Jew. That's how it is. And then they said, remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who when they said, 
destroy it, destroy it to its very foundation. O oh, daughter of Babylon, who are you to be destroyed? Happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Talk about vengeance. They're like, oh, Lord, you take care of them. Happy that person is going to be praying for, Lord, you take care of our captives. So, guys, they had a heart to come back. During that time, those 70 years, they were occupying. They were also lamenting, longing, but they were holding on to the promise of return. You will bring us back. It's going to happen. Even the prophet Daniel which we'll talk about in a second. He was praying for, when, O oh Lord, when? And God sent the angel Gabriel to him to tell him the answer. And, and Satan so didn't want the answer coming, he, he blocked him. He blocked him to come in. And boy, there was a fight. And, and, and he got the word about, about what's going on. When are we going back? While in Babylon, though, we know that they were very, very successful. They were merchants. They were the merchant class. And they were very successful. They became wealthy. They worked jobs. They became wealthy. And they did well. We know this because of the book of Esther. And that's how they are. Because why? Because they're God's chosen people and they're under blessing and you can't get around that. They just do good wherever they're at. They make it through. When it was time to go home, they were doing so well in Babylon and in Persia that most of them stayed behind. The first wave of people to go back with... Uh, we, we see this in the book of Ezra. The first wave was only 50,000 people. Wasn't that many people. And they stayed behind. And there was a large Jewish population in Iraq and in Iran. Still to this day, well, now they all got chased out. But, uh, but some don't go back. The second and third generation said, I don't know what Israel is all about. I'm going to stay here. And they did. When they went into that 70 years of exile... God sent two amazing prophets. The first one was Ezekiel. Ezekiel, older person, was taken in that second and third wave. They were the priests. He was a priest. He spent 27 years, the first 27 years of captivity. When Ezekiel went, he comforted his people with the prophecies. You can read it. It's all written down in the book of Ezekiel. He sought vengeance for their enemies. He reminded them of the covenant. He, he says, your enemies will be dealt with. He talks about the glimpses of the, great, of the greatness of God, where you see God, uh, uh, Ezekiel use the phrase, by the mouth of God, I am the Lord, 30 times in the book. Talks about how restoration is coming, how he will bring them out. And they, he also said, I want to remind you why you're here. <laughs> and if you read Ezekiel, you'll see that. And God sent Ezekiel to them for that first, that first section, that first quarter of their existence in Babylon. And then, of course, the first wave, a young man was taken by the name of Daniel. Ezekiel was a priest. Well, Daniel was the kingly line. He was a young man, taken at the time. And you can read about his, well, you ladies are going to get into it. You know about it. He was a young man, great testimonies. Great testimonies his whole life. And he gets these visions. He gets these prophecies from God dealing with, really, the timeline of world empires. And, and, and the description, a detailed description about them. His prophecies are so detailed about the coming world empires that scholars today say that there's not just one Daniel, there must be around four Daniels. He's so accurate. They don't believe that God inspired it, so they say, well, we've got to figure out how he was so accurate, which is baloney. There's just one Daniel and one mighty God that told them everything that was going to happen. I mean, it was detailed. It was glorious. He also tells Daniel, God tells Daniel, when the Messiah is going to come back. He calls the day. 
Amazing. Why did God send Daniel and Ezekiel that were so, they, they talked about Israel and their, 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 their present state of exile, but he also went far ahead to their release, which will happen with Ezra, and also even farther than that, talking about things that will happen during the tribulation, things that are yet to happen with us. Why does he do that with Ezekiel and Daniel? Because this prophecy wasn't given to the church. Ezekiel 38 was for the Jews. It's, all these were for the Jews. He wanted to let the Jews know what's going to happen. That's why he did it. This is the thing with prophecy. And that's why this is why prophecy is so important to understand, to be, have it part of your uh, word intake. Guys, listen up. God doesn't want us to be ignorant concerning the future. He he's, doesn't want to say, oh, you know what? I'm not going to... God, I'm not going to give you any heads up, you know, whatever happens, happens. No, he tells us in a lot of detail, according to what the Bible says, what's going to happen. We have a pretty good ballpark about the future. I just thank God for that. Because God doesn't want to leave us in the dark. That's why God's word is a light. It's a, it illuminates the future for us. It tells us what's coming. It's a light to our path as we live this life. Isn't that great? And so, guys, I encourage you, get into, get into prophecy. Study it. A lot of people have a hands-off uh, mentality with prophecy. Oh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's too dark. We, it's amazing when you see certain pastors that they get to the book of Revelation and they go, oh, oh, let's not talk about that. Oh, I, I, oh I, I'm, I can't wait to get to the book of Revelation. I know you guys are too. I hear the request. Hey, can we just skip ahead? To, Re to Revel I hear some of you, I know who you are. You guys are, you know, can we just skip ahead? Oh, no. We, we, because when I get to heaven, I don't want James, Peter, and John, and Jude to attack me. Say, why didn't you teach them our book? So we have to go through it, okay? We have to go through all those four guys, and we'll get to Revelation, okay? And it will be well worth it. But let me tell you something. God doesn't want us to be in the dark. And so he lays it all out. So what happens after all this stuff? Well, the Babylonian Empire occurs, Nebuchadnezzar. And then there's a guy named Evil Merodach that comes up. And of course, he's connected with Jehoiachin. And then, then a guy by the name, uh, now I'm going to butcher this name, Nabadonidas. Nabadon, yeah. Nab on Adus. Nab on Adus, okay? He's the next ruler of the Babylonian Empire. But he decides not to be around that much in the area of Babylon. He leaves his son uh, as co-regent. His name is uh, Belshazzar. And Belshazzar's there. And I know last week I, I called him Belteshazzar, but that's Daniel's Babylonian, uh, Babylonian name. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but his name is Belshazzar. And he's the ruler co-regent while his daddy's away. And he's the one that sees the writing on the wall. And we talked about that last week. Of course, the kingdom ends with him in power. And the Medo-Persian Empire comes in, led by a king by the name of Cyrus. And they slap on the little adjective, Cyrus the Great. He's actually Cyrus the Second. And Cyrus the Great comes in, and he takes over the area. He takes over Babylon, uh, Babylon ba the, the city of Babylon, the Babylonian Empire. He takes over Turkey. He takes over uh, Israel. He takes over. He, he, uh, he, he can't get a hold of Egypt yet, but he's, he goes all the way up into Turkey and he controls that whole area. This is the Medo Persian Empire. The Medes are taken over by the Persians and they become less of an influence and it's just the Persians and the Medes are helping out as well. As Cyrus the Great is there, the supreme leader of the Persian Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire, we know that this guy is put in charge of just the area of Babylon or Babylonia. His name is Guburu. <laughs> You're like, what? Is, I've never heard of that name before. Guburu. I just love that name. It's a Subaru, but with a G. Guburu, okay? So Guburu's there, and he has another name. His name is Darius the Mede. 
and he runs just the Babylonian area underneath the official ruler Cyrus the Great. Darius the Mede meets this old Jewish guy who is the foreign minister and he says, I really like you. And he puts him in charge of stuff. He's third and one of the three top guys. And Darius just likes this guy. And of course, he has a problem. This guy's name is Daniel. And Daniel has a problem. It's called a prayer problem. He just prays too much. The other guys get jealous of him and try to pass a law. Don't pray to anybody but the king. And he breaks it, of course, and throws himself and gets thrown into the lion's den. And Darius comes back and says, did God deliver you through the night? You know the story. Sunday school stuff, guys. And God takes Daniel to the lion's den. And Darius the Mede is over just the Babylonian area. Cyrus the king is over everything. But that Cyrus the great guy is kind of cool. Because all the way back during the days of Hezekiah, Isaiah the prophet... And Isaiah 44 through 45 is talking. He goes, there's going to be a guy named, a, he's going to be a king named Cyrus. He calls him by name. He says, Cyrus is going to come and he's going to let you guys come back to the land. He's going to allow you guys to come back to the land and build the temple. And he calls that out hundreds of years, but hundreds of years ago. And the, the, the writings of Isaiah went with them. And Daniel's there over the new king of Cyrus. I wonder who went up to Cyrus first. I don't know who did it. But someone went up and says, hey, hey, you're in our book. Well, when was that written? Ah, oh, it was written a couple hundred years ago. But guess what? You are supposed to let us go. Well, guess what? I don't know how it went down, but Cyrus, and that's how all of Ezra starts off, was Cyrus the Great saying, you guys can go back to Israel and rebuild your temple. In fact, here's the riches that we stole from you. You could have those back, and you could go on ahead. And here's money. Just graciously gives the money. And he would release the Jews to go back to rebuild the temple. And in Ezra, in the book of Ezra, chapters 1 through 6, we see this story laid out. And it is awesome. It's the first part of Ezra. 50,000 Jews return with Shezbazar, Zerubbabel, and Joshua. Those are the leaders of the first wave. And they go. And they go back and they are told, hey, by God, build the temple. Instead of building the temple, they build the altar first because they want to deal with sin. And they build that altar. Well, that's Cyrus the Great. Well, he dies. His son, Cambyses II, he rules for only eight years, and then he dies. And then another guy named Darius I appears on the scene, a descendant of Cyrus. Now, this is the thing. You know, I'm not sure if he's a descendant, but Darius I comes to power. Now, this is the deal. Cyrus told them to go, but for around 10 years or so, they stall because they get resistance in Israel. They mess them up. They kind of tell Cyrus, these people are bad people. They're going to cause problems. Don't trust the Jews. And Cyrus goes, okay, I'll stop. And he puts a cold stop to the building of the temple. And they can't build. And they wait. They reapply <laughs> with the king, who's a new guy named Darius the first, and Darius the first says, "You know what? Go for it!" And he green lights it. During this time, Haggai and Zechariah, the prophets, are encouraging the people: "Just go ahead and rebuild it. Go ahead and rebuild it." And Darius the first gives them the green light. Now, Darius the first gives him the green light, but he also has this thing going on. He wants his empire to go west. He controls what is now modern-day Turkey, and he has his eye across the channel at a place called Greece. And so he goes over and invades Greece, and he is stopped at a battle called Marathon. And so he stopped there, and he comes back, and he goes, man, those Greeks are a little bit harder than I thought. And so, but in so doing, he really ticks off the Grecian people, which if you know anything about the Grecian people, that's a bad, you don't want that. They get mad. 
they can't stand the Persians. So they go back. Darius dies after giving them the green light to rebuild their temple. And that's the time they finish the building of their, or they start to, they start to, they start to build and they start to get it done. After Darius comes a guy named Xerxes. Xerxes comes to power. 44 years after the death of Cyrus the Great, a guy by the name of Xerxes comes to power. And he is obsessed with one thing, kill the Greeks. I can't stand them. And so he gets his invading army together and he crosses the channel and he lands in a place called Thermopylae. When he lands in a Thermopylae, he sees in front of him 300 Spartan soldiers. And Xerxes says, I could take these guys. Well, guess what? It's not as easy as he thought. They stand against him, and yes, they made a movie about this. And they stand against him, and they resist him, and finally he breaks through, but the cost is great. He finally moves and he sacks the city of Athens and then he gets in his boats to go back around and he is defeated at the battle of Salamis, which is a huge naval battle and he is utterly defeated by the Grecian armies. He's so broke, he comes back, he's mad. They throw a humongous citywide party during this party, him and his officials get drunk. Xerxes calls out, bring me my wife Vashti. Bring me my wife and make sure she's naked. And she says, I'm not coming that way. What are you talking about? He goes, oh, you tell me. And he's mad because he lost the war and he kicks her out of the country, divorces her, or they think maybe kill her. We don't know, it's lost in history. A couple of Days later, he misses his wife. He misses a queen. So he says, I didn't know the queen. He says, hey, let's have a beauty contest. Let's get the most beautiful woman. Let's pick the most beautiful woman out of all the kingdom. And so they grab every beautiful woman out of the kingdom, every, every one that is gorgeous. And there's this one young Jewish girl by the name of, what's her name? Yeah. Now, Esther, what's her Jewish name? Hadassah. And Hadassah's there, and man, she's gorgeous. And her uncle tells her, don't tell anyone you're Jewish. Change your name. Your name is Esther. So she goes, and Mordecai, the, well, the cousin, not the uncle. The cousin's there, and he discovers, this is a crazy thing, you know, he discovers a plot to kill the king, tells the, the, the officials the plot. It's, a, it's just a, it's a, it's a soap opera. And then, and then all of a sudden she becomes queen, Esther becomes queen of Xerxes. And, and then, uh, then he has this aide by the name of Haman who says, you want to get the money back that you lost? Oh, now it's not Purim yet, guys. You, you understand, when we get to Purim, we'll have a Purim party, okay? But this is the thing. So Haman says, oh my gosh. He goes, you want to make the money back that you lost from Greece? Why don't we just, there's this people that they're really successful here. They were supposed to go back, but not a lot of them did. And they're called the Jews. I hate the Jews. Let's just kill them all and take their money. And you get all the money back that you lost from your failed attempt to conquer Greece. And he goes, that's a great idea. And so they sign the thing, and then they accept the date, and they gamble on it, and just blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, Esther goes, we're going to die. And then her cousin's like going, dude, lays a guilt trip on her. If it's not you, it's going to be somebody else, but you're going to die if you don't do this. And she says, fine, I'll just go and announce it. And then, drama, drama. You're like, where is this at? In the book of Esther. And this is Xerxes. And of course, God delivers the whole nation, and they have a feast. They, they, that's all Jewish festivals are. You know, they try to they, they try to kill us. We won. Let's let's eat. And so when Xerxes dies by a coup, so they, his own officials kill him in his room. The next guy, Artaxerxes, his son takes over. His stepmother is Esther, and Artaxerxes is there, and he's getting a cup. He's getting a glass of wine, and he sees that the guy is shaking when he gives it to him. 
And he takes the cup and he goes, what's wrong with you? Nehemiah, what's wrong with you, Nehemiah? And he goes, oh, I just got word that the, I'm a Jew in my city, Jerusalem, the walls are busted up. My city is destroyed. It's just a, a, a shambles. And he goes, oh, you're bummed out about that? You go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And so he sends Nehemiah his cup there. Our exertion is the first to build the wall. And Ezra, that's chapter 7 through 10. And they go back and they rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Which is also the kickoff point for just some great stuff. And we'll get to that later. But Malachi the prophet is prophesying during this time. But that's, that's where Ezra comes in. You're like, man, this is a long story, Andrew. But this is this. You want to know what happened in 70 years? Really, actually more. The whole book of Ezra, for your knowledge, the whole book of Ezra is around 100 years in length. It, t it takes them 100 years in length to get everything, everybody back in the sink. But who's this Ezra guy? If you're taking notes, he's a priest. He's also a scribe. And he is obsessed with the word of God. In chapter 7, verse 10, you see that he's a skilled man in the law of the Lord. He's obsessed with the word. He also, we know, probably writes the book of Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles. Jewish tradition tells us that Ezra is the guy who takes these books, the Torah, the prophets, the history, and he puts them all together in what we know today as the Old Testament, or the Jews know them as the Tanakh. He puts them all together. He also starts this thing, this new thing. We're all away, and we don't have a really solid temple, but in Babylon, in Persia, Ezra's the guy that says, let's do kind of like a, a type of temple, and we'll call it a synagogue. So Ezra's the guy who starts these synagogue things, according to Jewish tradition, and he's also the guy that gets 120-some people together and starts this thing called the Sanhedrin. And he puts them all together as, as, as a, a law-abiding, or people to, to have laws for the Jewish people laid out. He's a direct descendant of Aaron through, the, through his grandson Phineas. And if you know anything about Phineas, it's a good guy to belong to. But that's the whole story. That's the whole timeline. And you're like, oh, man, I didn't take notes. It will be on YouTube tonight. Go back and listen to it. But this is the thing, guys. What is the book of Ezra all about? And we'll close with this. It's two sections, chapter 1 through 6, and then chapter 7 through 10. The first wave that happened... Uh, that happens first takes 20 years to accomplish. Verse 1 through 6 is 20 years. Uh, ch sorry, chapter 1 through 6 is 20 years long. And then there's a gap in between chapter 6 and 7 of 60 years. And then chapter 7 through 10 takes around 25 years to accomplish. So it's around 100 years. What's the whole book about? A lot of R's. Are you ready? Number one, it's about records. When you read this, you're going to get names, just like in Chronicles. The reason why he wrote those names out in Chronicles and spent such a long, long time, and then also the same names are mentioned again, but less amount of those who went back, because he wanted to make sure that they were really Jewish and really Levites that were participating in the temple and no fake Levites. In fact, there's a section in Ezra where there's a group of Levites that can't trace their ancestry back to the temple and they're not allowed to help in the temple until they go to the Ulam and the Thummim and ask God, are these people really Levites or not? That's how serious Ezra is. So it's a book of records about those going back to the land, but the priests and Levites, who is the remnants? that is going back to Israel. Also, it's a book of return and release. Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes I were all about helping the Jews get back to the land. It's about God's plan of return for the people to their land. The next thing, it's about restoration. You see immense grace occurring by the hand of God, restoring the Jewish people back to their, their land. Boy, oh boy, just grace, God's work. 
In fact, through the prophet Zerubbabel on their first wave in chapter 1 through 6, the prophet, um, sorry, Zerubbabel is there, sorry, the prophet Zechariah, excuse me, the prophet Zechariah is talking to Zerubbabel the head guy who's in charge of this migration back to Israel. And God speaks through Zechariah. He says, hey, Zerubbabel, you want a word? Here it is. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's not going to be done by your hand or the hand of the Jewish people. It's a work of the spirit. What a lesson for us. Amen. Zechariah chapter four, verse six. And he reminds them of that. But it's such grace. It's God's work, not our work. It's going to be God who builds the house. It's also a thing about remembering. They're always remembering back to the good old days. They're remembering back. So you'll see a lot of remembering in the book of, of Ezra. You'll also see rejoicing, tremendous rejoicing. You also see the rebuilding and how they built it, laid the foundation. Both the first and second time they got stopped halfway through for a couple of years. The rebuilding. But then there's also regrets. <laughs> it's you're like, how can regret be re with rejoicing? Well, there's a lot of regrets. The people are going to be regretting what happened 70 years previously. They're going to regret that they sinned. They're going to be regretting that happened because they're going to realize that we lost so much. But then when they go back to that first wave, and then some 80 years pass, and Ezra and Nehemiah finally show up, something's going to happen. You know what's going to happen? They're going to realize that the people that have been there for around 80 years after they've been sent by Cyrus to go out, that those people who were just there, they really didn't complete the, the house of God. They just kind of, they just got lazy. And they got more in tune with building their own houses. And they weren't tithing. And they weren't doing anything. And they just said, ah, so what? They, they just didn't care about the house of God stuff. And, and they went so far as to start to intermarry with pagan peoples that weren't Jewish. And guess who was intermarrying? The Levites and the priests were intermarrying. And when Ezra comes in, it says that Ezra rips his hair out, rips his clothes, and just cries out. And he lays down the, on, the, on the ground, and he cries out for a fast. And you, I'll tell you, you learn what it means to repent. That's the other R word. You, it's a, it is a master class on repenting. What does it mean? It says that I called a fast for the people to humble ourselves before the Lord. Humble ourselves. Get down and just say, God, we're sorry. It's a master class on repentance from the humble heart. And then you also learn about resistance. How the enemy resists the work of God to build his house. The whole book of Ezra is building the temple of God, the house of God, so that they could deal with sin, worship the Lord, and get back to the Lord. And guess what? The enemy will come in and resist you every time. Oh, guys. I've been praying all day that God would give me a heart of return. I just want to get back to where I want to be with the Lord. I want to repent and rebuild the things that are broken down in my life. I want to be restored and I want to remember the goodness of God and I want to rejoice in the Lord. I want to rebuild those things that, the, that, that have been broken down by compromise. Don't compromise. There's a lot to learn in the book of Ezra. So just don't think it's some boring history book. It is not that. There are some lessons to be learned in this book. And I, hopefully just tonight we just wet your whistle for this stuff, guys. But you're like, well, what's the spiritual application? You know what it is? Just return to the Lord. Just go back to where you... If you left them, if you've been, if you've been, if you've been, uh, maybe in your life you kind of just drifted away. Maybe in your life you just kind of, you know, I used to be so on fire for the Lord, now I'm not. Just return. Just come back. It, it, re rebuild those things that have been broken down. Set up that altar of your, uh, in your heart to the Lord again. And just return. Repent. Humble yourself before the Lord. And get back to where we need to be with God. 
It's so important. And Ezra teaches us that. I encourage you guys this week, your homework is to read the whole book of Ezra, read the whole book of Zechariah, read the whole book of Haggai, and get into those three books. And if you want to, yeah, that's it. We'll, we'll, we'll tackle the, the other prophet later on. Uh, but guys, I'll tell you, get into those three books. Read them, and you'll be blessed. You will be blessed. God has something for you. Amen? Dear Lord, we just thank you for the book of Ezra. We thank you for our time that we look forward to being here on Wednesday nights. Father, we ask that, Lord, if there's anything in our lives that we need to just rebuild, let it be by your hand, by the work of your spirit, and not of ours. We want to be just, we want to return back to those sweet moments with you in all things. Fill us to overflowing with your spirits. Restore those things in our life that need to be restored. Father, if it's a lack of Bible reading, Lord, rebuild it. If it's a lack of prayer, rebuild it. If it's a lack of walking in the Spirit, rebuild it. Oh God, if it's a lack of fellowship, Lord, rebuild it. We just want to repent right now. We just love you and praise you and thank you for being our God. In Jesus' name, amen. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. I love you guys. Jesus loves you. Have a great rest of the night and day. Tomorrow.